coming, everyone, to Bear Pond Books. Good evening and welcome. We are celebrating the new memoir by Madeline May Cunin. We are honored to host Madeline here tonight and also thrilled to welcome Representative Jill Krowinski from Chittenden County. She will be up to introduce Madeline in a few moments. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Please mute or turn off your cell phones. Pictures are fine, but there's nothing worse than a, a ringtone going off in the middle of the <laughs> That always happens, believe it or not, the authors go, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. Um, please use the back door if you need to exit during the reading, because the front door is now locked and will remain locked until after the talk. We do have a restroom at the back of the store to the right. If you'd like to learn more about Bear Pond Books events, please sign up on our newsletter. It's being passed around. Um, we do have journalist and author Garrett Graff. He'll be here Tuesday, October 23rd for a lively discussion about the Mueller Russia investigation and Graff's newly co-authored book, Dawn of the Cold War, and that's about cybersecurity. We do also have coming up on Friday, November 2nd, a poetry reading at the Unitarian Church called Bullets into Bells, Poets and Citizens Respond to Gun Violence. Um, that's going to have Major Jackson, Matthew Oldsman, Karen McCadden, and other speakers. We're selling tickets for $5. They're available here, and it's a fundraiser for Gun Sense Vermont. You can also follow you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at Bear Pond Books, and you can keep abreast of our news that way as well. I'd like to thank Orca Media. They're here filming tonight's event. You will see the video of tonight's event if you sign up for our newsletter. I'd also like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. And I'd like to thank you in advance for buying this beautiful book, Coming of Age, My Journey to the 80s. Um, it's really quite a beautiful, moving book. It's filled with wisdom and love poems, hope and honesty. Uh, Madeline talks about everything from downsizing and moving to Wake Robin to her changed body and this new moonscape. Um, such beautiful writing. If you don't already have a copy, I urge you to pick one up tonight. Madeline will be able to sign them at the end of the night. If you do have a copy, I think you should get one for a friend, too. They make a great gift. <laughs> One more, um, oops, sorry. I was gonna mention about when, um, about the book signing, excuse me. When the talk is finished, if you could just remain seated for a moment so we can get Madeline situated in a chair with a little table and then form the book signing line, that would be great. And with that, I'm going to welcome up Representative Jill Krowinski. Thank you so much, and thank you for Bearcon Books for organizing this event and inviting me here to introduce Governor Madeline Kunin. It is such an honor, and it's just such a tribute uh, to see this crowd here for you uh, tonight because of all the incredible work you have done, um, not only for our state, but for our country and for women. You know, I can't, I can't remember the exact moment um, or speech it was that I first met Madeline, but I remember I remember distinctly her saying, well, you know, ladies, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And, uh, I'm sticking with this one. <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I think I, I met Madeline when, when I was just getting my start in politics in Vermont, and we spent a lot of time over the years talking about our frustration about how can we get more women to feel comfortable to run for office? Uh, I think the most recent statistic says a woman needs to be asked seven times um, before she agrees to run. And can anyone guess how many times an average man needs to be asked? Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was about six years ago that uh, we, Madeline and I, and Representative Keisha Rahm at the time, were, were sitting um, appropriately enough at a table, at Madeline's kitchen table, uh, talking about us taking action because 
we felt that we were moving backwards now and not forward. And I think that that moment is a true testament to, you know, what I think part of her legacy is, which is encouraging women to serve and to run for office. And it was at that kitchen table that Emerge Vermont was born. And Emerge Vermont is an organization that recruits and trains women to run for office. And it has a comprehensive training program that uh, runs the course over six months, uh, training women over 70 hours in skill sets like public speaking and organizing and fundraising and really gives women that opportunity to learn how to run for office. And I, when I think about these um, the trainings and the women that have gone through the trainings and I, I move it out of Madeline's kitchen and I go to the state house and I'm as we grow the eMERGE program a couple of years ago I was walking through the halls of the state house and it was my first or second term and you know it's uh, a stark reminder of, of the progress that we still have to make in our country when the only portrait of a woman um, on the first floor of the state house is the one of Madeline uh, from from when she was governor. And as you walk the halls throughout the state house, there aren't many other photos or portraits of women. And so we have a lot of work to do to help mentor and train especially young women who are in that building um, and why we need to get more photos of women up there and in those positions so that they have that reminder um, of their, their role and their role in democracy and why it's so important. And it was a little while after we had gotten the program running that I was in the House chamber listening to a debate about whether uh, your boss should have a say over whether birth control should be included in your insurance program. And I thought, man, I feel like we're going backwards here and having this debate about birth control because it was decade, several decades earlier uh, across the way in the Senate chamber uh, that it was Lieutenant Governor Madeline Kunin breaking the tie vote for funding for Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just interesting. <laughs> she uh, cast an incredibly important vote that day. And I remember um, Madeline telling the story about overhearing some of the senators saying that it was best to keep them barefoot and pregnant. And uh, it was outrageous to hear then, and unfortunately it's outrageous to hear now. You're, you're hearing that now in this time. And so, again, looking at the Emerge program and why it's so critical, and we're talking about this possible pink wave coming uh, after uh, the, the debate over the Supreme Court, right? So in my mind and in this journey, we move from the State House to what's happening in Washington. And I think uh, what what happened over Trump's uh, Supreme Court nomination is, is uh, really a stark reminder about what's at stake for our country, our state, our state and why these elections are so important and why women in leadership to help um, build the sisterhood uh, to, to support women who are running is, is just so, so important right now. And Madeline has been the core of that in our state, and we are so fortunate to have her leadership. Even, even now, when asking her for advice about what I should be doing, I was asking her about several different options, and she's like, why don't you just do both? <laughs> and that's what I liked. But that is an example of just uh, the, the kind of mentor and role model she, she is. And um, so just quickly going back to the State House from Washington, this past year I was serving as House Majority Leader thanks to Madeline's encouragement, and we were having a debate about pregnancy protections in the workplace. And it, it struck me um, that, you know, she could have been having this debate, Madeline, when she was serving in the House in the 70s. And even after hours of debate, we, there were still 43 people who voted against that bill. This is just basic pregnancy protections in the workplace for women. And so um, I just think that her work is still uh, so critical today. And when she started in the 70s in the House, she was, I think, one of 17 women serving at that time. And now we are at 60 women in the House. So we are making progress. I'll, I'll say, though, uh, that this year uh, is the fifth year anniversary of Emerge. And what's really exciting to report is that uh, we have currently 20 
uh, emerged alumni who are current legislators at the State House, and we have 19 on the ballot. So, you know, I could go on and on and telling amazing stories about Madeline's leadership and her mentorship. But I think it was fitting that it was only a couple weeks ago that she, Keisha, and I were back on the phone talking about Kavanaugh and the hearings and having um, a conversation with Madeline about when she testified at the Anita Hill hearings. And um, again, it was just coming back together of, I can't, you know, here we are at the same, at the same place. But it, we were reminded about the pink wave then and how we could have this pink wave now. And so I just, um, I just, I think that the timing of this book, and one of the phrases that um, I've heard Madeline and her late husband John talk about is seizing the day. And I think of this book and the timing so appropriate in saying that now, yeah, more than ever, it's it's time to seize the day and take this opportunity. So it is just, um, again, just such an honor to be able to introduce Governor Cunin, former governor, ambassador, uh, leader, and role model forever, Madeline. Thank you so much, Joe. I mean, Jill is a wonderful example of the next generation who is seizing the torch and going to run all the way to continue to promote equality for women. We still need champions like Jill. Um, it's very nice to be invited here. And this is a wonderful bookstore. and. Uh, just put in a pitch for private bookstores. Yeah. Uh, yeah. bookstores. Yeah. I didn't hear you, but whatever. But Independent I, bookstores. Independent, that's the word I was looking for. Yes. So, you know, why did I write this book? Um, I must admit, I had some trepidation um, about what I wrote and having it become public. Um, I sort of entered a new stage about five or ten years ago where I just felt that I didn't need to protect myself in the same way that I did when I was in public life. You know, you sort of shrink wrapped and you have to be careful what you say and how it will be interpreted. And I went to sort of a deeper thought and deeper observation. That's one of the luxuries, if you're fortunate, of getting older, that you have a little more time to think and to observe and to just be human. Um, and there's sort of an intensity about your thinking because and your actions, because you know you can, you don't have that much time. So time becomes something you almost count in a different way than when you're young and you think you have forever. Uh, you don't have, you know, it's like, well, I, I mentioned this in my book, so yeah, go to the book. But, so when you write a book like this, you're asked for advice about how to stay young or how to stay happy or how to stay well. Uh, and there really is no advice as such in this book. It's not a how-to book. It would be called How to Stay Young. Uh, uh, there's no magic formula, but there is a certain liberty in getting older. Um, and one example was that um, I attended a function where women who were thinking of running for office and the question was, um, how do you dress? And some of you may remember there was a book in the 70s 
which became a Bible, was called How to Dress for Success. Do you have, I see heads nodding. So the model wore a simple navy blue suit with a white blouse with a little frill around the neck <laughs> to show the feminine side. And as they were talking about what to wear, you know, it was a similar discussion uh, as in the iconic book. And I thought at one point, I can dress wherever I want. <laughs> <laughs> it's that kind of freedom that you get as you get older. Well, I'll start. I've been writing poetry off and on, uh, but I really started, concentrated on writing poetry um, about four or five years ago. I also want to give credit to my husband who died last January, but he gave me the courage to write in a different way and he read the first draft of this book and, and read everything I wrote. This is called, is this the right volume? Am I yeah. holding it too yeah. close or too? Good. It's good. It's okay. No longer, no longer will we make love before breakfast. No longer will I dream of seeing New Zealand or the Cape of Good Hope or bears in the wild. No longer will I say yes more than no. No longer will danger sparkle and safety look dull. No longer will I look at my body without comparison between who I was and who I have become, blaming the light for the difference. <laughs> no longer can I toss my hair over my face and count 100 strokes. No longer can I do without night cream and day cream, slathering on ounce after ounce. No longer can I be comfortable sitting in my chair reading for hours without getting up to stretch my arms and legs. No longer can I walk without looking down at my feet to avoid mean cracks and malicious bumps. <laughs> No longer can I skip down the stairs like a girl flying without feeling a thing. No longer can I approach the precipice without swaying against my will. No longer do I think ahead of where I will be in 10 years or 20 or more. Now I think in ones or twos or threes, long enough to still hunger for the food of life. No longer do I wish for the next day or the next year to come quickly, like I did the year I turned 10. I want the days to saunter, like a leisurely museum stroller who stops now and then to gaze and get closer to the canvas to see the brush strokes, and then steps back for the long view before moving on. So, oh, nice. Nice. Thank you. Beautiful. Nice. This, uh, this is in prose. It's called the, the, the Year I Turn. Oh, maybe I'll use it. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind. No. The Year I Turned 80. The year I turned 80, the color red invaded my palette. I bought a new red Prius, thinking it might be my last car. Last car sounds like last breath, and I wanted to go out in a blast. If I hadn't worried about the wind further destroying my hair, my ears, and my eyes, I would have gone for a convertible. <laughs> I had owned my old Prius for nine years. It was beige and it blended silently in with the other cars in the parking lot. Sometimes it took me several panicked minutes, <laughs> it has to be here somewhere, <laughs> to find it in the rows of vehicles. As I pushed my cumbersome shopping cart, I hoped no one would notice that I was lost or rather that my car was lost. <laughs> my red car would be different. 
to be on the alert, happily signaling to me, even from a distance. My new Prius was the color of the year, Barcelona red. The marketed people had gotten it right. Not only did the name feel beautiful on the tongue, but Barcelona red also evoked sunlit images. At the time, my second husband, John, and I visited Spain. The deep, vibrant red sparkled on the car lot. It was a young color. It had a touch of daring to it. I once read that red cars are picked up more often for speeding than other colors. I was ready to take the risk. <laughs> I wanted to defy the dark expect expectations of my age. Once I took it on the road, the rear view mirror showed me the standard gray interior, but when I looked at the side mirrors, I saw exactly what I wanted to see, a color that vibrates with life. I'm trying to edit a little bit because this is rather known. I talk about my balls and then the move to Wake Robin was a promising time in our lives. My husband had recently come out of a prolonged depression and had recovered from a bout of insomnia. We both agreed that the decision to move to Wake Robin had sparked his recovery. We had a plan for our old age. Our children would not be burdened when we reached the dreaded age of dependency. If one of us died first, the other would not have to cope alone. The cottage was the most attractive one on campus. Tall trees framed it on two sides, and I could see the sunset through their silhouettes. In preparation for the move, with my son Daniel's help, I bought some secondhand Danish modern in Montreal. I surprised myself by choosing the same style of furniture I had when I was married to Arthur, my former husband. When John and I married, we intermingled our possessions. He had a dark walnut table from his grandparents, and I had a spindly hand-painted Biedermeyer writing desk and matching chairs. But our joint investment would be two comfortable chairs. John's, eb Thanks. John's ebullient mood changed. He spotted the big, comfortable leather chair first, <laughs> sat in it, and decided we should buy two for the study. I didn't think the study was large enough for two chairs with matching ottomans, and suggested the living room instead. We didn't argue. Together, we looked over swatches of material. I didn't want leather. Perhaps leather was a lifetime purchase, and we did not have a lifetime. We did not inquire about warranties. <laughs> we looked through books of swatches, lots of colors, and a choice of fabric. I spotted a bright red square and stopped. It leapt up at me. I asked John, could we be bold and choose red? Why not, he replied with his agreeable smile. I tried to picture the red chairs in our new living room. No question they would be bright. No question they would stand out. They would be contemporary. We would not be living in the past, surrounded only by possessions each of us had accumulated over 50 years. Our retirement home would be a sharp departure from that of the couple who had occupied it before us and had been moved to assisted living. We were the young couple. <laughs> I pushed away the questions, when would it be our turn? When would we have to move out to assisted living or skilled nursing? It had been hard for the other couple to leave but they left nothing behind, and I was glad. Let's go for the red chairs, John and I agreed. The saleswoman was surprised, and I was pleased to see her reaction. <laughs> Not the beige, brown, or black chair couple she had expected. <laughs> As the months went by waiting for the chairs to arrive, which had been especially ordered from Sweden, I began to have second thoughts. <laughs> would they work as I had anticipated, or would they be a disaster? Had we decided too quickly, 
Why hadn't I deliberated longer, giving darker colors a chance? When the tears arrived, shrink-wrapped in heavy pl plastic, the two men who unloaded them had to use a knife to release them from bondage. There they stood, two solid walls of red. They're so big, actually. They look different to the showroom. My husband was dismayed. He had had a relapse of his insomnia and depression. They're not what I expected either, he said. The chairs blazed in the room. <laughs> I hoped they would cure his insomnia and cheer him up. <laughs> we tried placing one chair in the living room and the other in the study. Better, but not right. My stepdaughter came to fix the computer and sat in one of the chairs. I like them, they're comfortable. Really? I questioned. John and I became obsessed. We talked about them over breakfast, lunch, and I would take a look at them before going to bed. Again, first thing in the morning. Is they looked any better? But they didn't. Let's stop talking about the chair, he said, as the insomnia weakened him. Yes, we won't talk about them anymore, I agree. But it was hard. <laughs> I called the furniture store to ask if we could return them. The owner was properly dismayed. He was polite, didn't want to displease a customer, but clearly he was upset. Keep them until Monday, and then tell me what you think, he suggested. The next day, I placed a square black pillow with a brilliant red flower leaping to the edges in the corner of our beige couch. My son Daniel had given it to us as a housewarming gift. It lifted the couch out of its neutrality and tied it to the red chairs. A sudden improvement. My son Adam came to dinner, and my friend Veronica stopped by. Adam sat in one chair, and Veronica in the other. The chairs looked different when someone sat there. <laughs> Their bodies blotted out much of the red. <laughs> Thumbs up, my son Adam said. If you don't like the color, you can get slip covers. <laughs> His wife had done that with a cat scratched couch. <laughs> True, but why slip cover new chairs? <laughs> I looked at the chairs once more. I asked myself whether I could ever own them. <coughs> would I feel comfortable or would they always jolt me, make me jumpy, on edge? Why hadn't I chosen the light, neutral textures with which I'd surrounded myself in the past? Silent, relaxing colors that made the living room a calm refuge from the harsh and noisy world outside. Part of me, I realized, no longer wanted a refuge. I wanted to bring life inside, not leave it at the door. And the red chairs did exactly that. They were loud, they were vivid. Day by day, I began to see that they had precisely what I had wanted. Brilliance. One bright morning, my husband and I arrived at the same decision. Let's keep them. <laughs> sheets in his bed. These are not the right sheets, he said, letting the corners limp down over the edge. Just tuck them in, I said, with a hint of annoyance that he didn't know better. They always fit on my bed, I said exactly what I thought, knowing that, I, that I might not be understood or worse, offend. There was a slight grating echo in our words, which we heard in different ways. In other times, with other people, it would have shredded the tide that bound them. But on this time, with the two of us, the tear was so quickly revolving, 
that we looked at each other and laughed. <laughs> this is called I Am Not Old. I could be the oldest person in the audience, but so what? My age drops to the floor and I step on it with my dancing feet. Mavis Staples is shaped like a muffin, dressed in a swishy black top and matching swinging black silk pants. Her hair is like a blonde bowl. It sparkles. She is escorted on stage by the hand of a dark-suited assistant. She needs help, but when the band starts to jive, she rolls across the stage like a loose marble. Her shoulders pump up and down to the music. Her arms are swinging and her feet kick off gravity. Then she opens her mouth and out it comes, a powerful voice that blasts into the crowd. She's got it, they clap. She's still got it. How old is she, I ask the woman next to me, who seems to know all the songs. I don't know, she replies. I guess. Mavis tells the audience that the stable singers have been singing for 65 years. Let's see, 80 or 85, maybe? I'm so excited, Mavis exclaims more than once between songs. She is outrageously happy. Then she pauses, spot, spotting a familiar face in the audience, and reaches down. He jumps on the stage, tall, dressed in white pants and jacket with lanky long hair. He runs to her side and hugs her. They sing a song or two together, and then they dance. Did you see me dance? She coquettishly asked the audience. I almost fell down, but he held me up. I clap with the crowd, moving my feet and shoulders, trying to keep up. The crowd hoots and hollers. I release my voice. I shout, surprising myself. When the bass guitarist has a solo, he bends his body in like a straw. He holds his own instrument in a lover's embrace. He makes it sing in a high-pitched voice. A voice so beautiful, so plaintive, like the singing of a loon. The drummer has his turn. He builds up the sound to a mad tempo, like jazz drummers do. But this time, perhaps because his hair is white, I pound the drums with him. I allow myself to drum the hell out of those drums. <laughs> it feels so good. I am not old. <laughs> Did I love you for that? I listened to the distant clattering in the kitchen while I sat in my chair reading the newspaper. We shared most tasks then, but you did the driving and I could sit and we I could sit still by your side with only a rare glance in the rear view mirror to check if it was safe to pass. Now I do everything, cook and wash the pots and meet the dishwasher's greedy demands. I make the bed which you once made when we slept together. I push your wheelchair and straighten my back, not letting it sink into a stoop before it's time. I feel my muscles tighten up the incline. I wish you could feel it too from your blue position. You need me now to move in any direction, up and down and around corners without bumping into things like winter boots thrown casually on the floor. I take the lead, pulling you out of yourself and into the world I inhabit. You visit me from time to time, like you used to do when you did the dishes and the counters always needed wiping. This evening is better than this morning when you berated yourself for growing old. What can I do, he asked. You ask, 
pleading with yourself. I whispered, nothing. Evenings we meet on the sofa and talk about a story in the New York Times or a scene from the evening news. We are same-minded again. The world is spilling, spinning crazily out of its orbit. We shake our hands from side to side in rhythmic disbelief. I reach for your still hand, cover it with mine, and keep it there. danced in circles to the rapid beat of the Onion River jazz band. She was young again, unbound, free, no longer pushing him, but flying with him on the dance floor. He waved aside the ribboned oxygen tube streaming behind him. I grasped John with both hands and brought him to his feet, placing the walker within reach. He moved his head and then his arms and then his feet to the music. We danced, we sang with the walker between us and love and silence. Mm -hmm. We want to leave time for questions, but I'll just try to find downsizing. It's a little long, but I'll try to cut it. <laughs> you didn't downsize it? <laughs> you didn't downsize it? <laughs> That's right. I should have. I thought of that. Well, I'll read it. I harbor a sentimental longing for a homestead, a place where each generation has written their births and deaths in the family Bible kept in a safe place. For World War II scattered us about to England, to Israel, and to America in search of safety. That is why I cannot dispose of my mother's good white tablecloths with matching initial napkins or get rid of Ambert's, Albert's, Rosenthal, Goldet's, teacups, and flowering dessert, past, flowering dessert plates. They are my past. I walk through the condo and See the mag survey the magnitude of the moving job ahead. Books and more books, boxes and boxes of stored papers, stacks of writings that someday may be discovered by one of my children and assembled into another book or provide material for an historian. Photographs of the children of me with dignity, dignity cherish of me at various stages of my public life fly fishing, signing bills, tapping the first maple tree, standing in the center of a group of women, of a group of children, of a group of men. The books, the books are the hardest to sort out. I have been thrilled to read the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell, which everyone was talking about in the 1970s. I stepped into the lives of unfaithful friends described by John Updike. I was intrigued by the inner lives of Philip Roth's male characters. I fell in love with Anita Bruckner's lonely woman and wrote her a fan letter to which she replied. Do I keep or give away? Do I keep it or give it away? Will the library even take this old book? I, I hold on to it, knowing I'm not likely to read it. This was Evangeline, which was required reading in New York's public schools. The closets are scrunched up with clothes from our four seasons and several lifetimes. I'm not ready to give away the expensive silk suit I wore at Peter and Lisa's wedding 23 years ago. I have worn it only once since the wedding, but still it costs so much. <laughs> <laughs> the, same, 
Thinking prevents me from disposing of the ice blue silk suit I wore for my swearing in as ambassador to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I was pleased that my elegant attire could equal the ornate gold trimmed room of the State Department. I have a photo of me and Madeleine Albright who officiated. I take each suit out of the closet one at a time, give them a final tender look and mercilessly squash them into the black plastic trash bag. <laughs> I pull the red plastic ribbon tight. They may have another life, I console myself, thinking of their happy dis rediscovery. The three formal gowns from each of my inaugural balls are stored in the downstairs coat closet, off to one side, side safe in their hermetically sealed and zippered bag. I designed them myself, and an Austrian dressmaker made them. And on it goes. And it, I have to save them. They belong to history. This is what the first female governor of Vermont wore at her inaugural ball. I consider calling the Vermont Historical Society to ask if they will store them. The thought of the gowns displayed on mannequins who look perpetually young is pleasing. <laughs> the gowns will continue to be who I once was. As with many such ideas, I never follow up. Instead, I asked the moving company to provide a tall cardboard clothing box that I place in the storage cage number 18 in the basement of Rick Robin for $20 a month. It seems worth it. <laughs> so much of what we decide to keep is built on someday. Someday we might need it. Someday we would wish we had kept it. Someday is shorter than it used to be. The word itself has shrunk. If someday hasn't happened by now, I have to accept that it's not likely that it will. If I haven't looked through my library for beautiful art books in the past 10 years, I probably won't take them down from the shelf in the next five or in whatever time I've left. Something no one wants, but I can't give away. I have two silver tea sets. One belonged, one belonged to my mother and the other to Aunt Bear. Every middle-class European bride once was given such a set as a wedding present. My mother once confessed to me with an unusual note of jealousy in her voice that her older sister Bert said was made of genuine silver while hers was <laughs> For some years after I inherited my mother said I polished it, not as well as my mother or a housekeeper might have done, but well enough to find a place for it on the dining room buffet. Then I stopped polishing and it was kept in the dark. That is how it ended up in the laundry room, behind the door on top of an old sewing machine. <laughs> It deserves better. My mother would be dismayed. She had insisted on including the tea set among the few possessions she packed to come to America. It was like us, a refugee, a reminder of comfortable middle class life. As I placed the tarn tarnished silver lid back on the sugar bowl, I turned to my son, Daniel, with a question. Do you take it? He agrees. <coughs> I'll just read the end here. My possessions are moved out in separate brigades. Three cars and six Burlington Library volunteers arrive on schedule one morning to take away all the box books. First Adam and then Daniel help me bring things to the synagogue. Peter brings things to the Goodwill. My friends Nancy and Peter distribute five filing cabinets and a set of bookcases. I arrange for a rug, art books, and a coffee table to be brought to my daughter, Julia, in Brooklyn. The owner of the second-hand furniture store from whom we had bought the dining room table comes and decides which pieces to take back. Slowly, the condo undresses itself. I call 1-800-JUNK. <laughs> <laughs>
We take everything, the man on the phone says. Anything I repeat, anything. Two medium-sized trucks pull in and stop in front of the garage. I give them everything that is left. Flower pots, rakes, rakes, old pictures, old pots and pans. You sure you want to give us that? One of the men is holding up a plaster flamingo figure I made when I was taking a sculpture class. It's an old guy. I am ruthless. Yes, take it, take it. I repeat, feeling a sudden surge of fierce happiness. The driver is having a great time. He finds a silver wig in the trash can. It's gone. One Halloween, I wore it for fun at a staff meeting in the Department of Education. He finds another treasure, a gold cardboard crown studded with glass diamonds and balances on top of the sparkling wing. He waves to me from inside the truck, one leg hooked over the wooden side panel. He looks historic, hilarious. I laugh and wave back. Before he leaves, he takes a wide broom, broom and sweeps the entire garage. I feel cleansed, liberated, light. It is over. five she saw you sitting at your governor's desk and it was like no big deal that a woman could be the governor of Vermont and that stuck with her ever since. So she'll be governor someday. <laughs> well uh, in, in the same uh, vein you as John I'm a, a guide at the State House and every day when I pass by your portrait I wonder what made you decide to sit in the governor's chair to have your portrait done there? It's so lovely. It's required. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it looks better and better to me every year. <laughs> It's not a question. I think I speak for everyone by saying we love you, Madeline. Yeah. 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 You've touched all of our lives. You've been a person of honor and integrity and have paved the way for many, many women in this state. And we honor you with all our hearts. Well, I did want to thank you very much. I didn't want to write another political book. I mean, I wrote, this is my fourth book. The first book was also a memoir. It's longer, uh, but it's also personal, but not in quite the same way. Uh, I wanted to explain, you know, my journey to becoming governor, and I wanted other people to understand so they could emulate me. And so uh, even at that time, I was thinking we need more women in political office. And then the second book was Girls, Politics, and Power. And I interviewed <laughs> other women politicians. And um, that was interesting. And then the third, in between, I wrote a guidebook to Vermont. Uh, with another writer, um, 
that was hard work because every time we said this hotel is open or this restaurant is open on Monday and Friday, it changed. <laughs> uh, we had to keep updating it endlessly. Much easier to write about yourself. <laughs> no research. Uh, but uh, then I wrote The New Feminist Agenda, or I never liked the title because I thought it might scare off people who are frightened of feminists. And it turned out I never could find out whether that was true or not. But today it's probably more true than it was um, five years ago, as more women, if they're not using the word feminist, they're certainly taking action and stepping up and speaking out. So. Um, this book is an inward book. I'm not trying to influence anybody. I'm, and I'm trying to be as unselfconscious as possible. But I must admit, I got very nervous when in a review I saw some quotations from the book. I said, oh my god, it's really out there. <laughs> and, and I guess long-term writers or professional writers go through that, even with fiction, uh, you reveal some of yourself. And I've been very surprised and happy about the reaction that people can connect to it, uh, whether it's downsizing or whether it's taking care of an ailing spouse. Um, and in that sense, it makes me feel very, very, very good. Um, so you've given me, I'm tempted to say, a new lease on life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love the poetry in the book, and I, I know that you have always loved poetry, but could you talk a little bit more about how that sort of, you said that you started writing poetry five years ago, but how that kind of came about? Well. Um, I've always loved poetry, and uh, I've written some poems in between. But, you know, to write poetry you need time and quiet and space. To write anything, really, except maybe a news release, which you can write in campaign news release, you can write in five minutes. Um, but I've also been writing uh, commentaries on VPR, and you have to write those as like 400 words, and it's a discipline mm -hmm. to get that in the right shape. And some of these pieces here are, are a slight revision of those commentaries. But I don't know, I just went into a different zone. Um, I think when you take walks um, and you become observant and look at the sky, I mean, all those sort of corny sounding things, uh, let your mind imagine the ne sees the next word. Um, yes. And of course in politics I could never do that. Uh, not only because I didn't want to be that personal, but because of the sheer time, you know. And even if, if you say, okay, I'm going to write a poem this afternoon, it may not happen this afternoon. <laughs> Probably won't. Uh, so you just, and you need to be alone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's important. So I'm grateful, and I plan to write some more poems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Well, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Yeah.